We express our praise and gratitude to Allah Ta'ala and we seek blessings on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. So we're continuing our exploration of Surah Ali Imran. And yes, okay, so we're looking at Ayah 13. So again, just to recap very, very briefly, the first part of the surah, so to speak, is speaking about Allah Ta'ala uh, sending down books, meaning He is the one who is the author of the books. He is also the one who is the author of our destinies. And then from there we had the du'as, these very good du'as to, to, uh, uh, to learn. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِرْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ حَدَيْتَنَا وَحَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَابِ رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ جَامِعُ النَّاسِ لِيَوْمِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُخْلِقُ الْمِعَادِ And so from there we are asking Allah Ta'ala not to, not to let us go astray after He has guided us. And those who, who reject, however, uh, their wealth or children will not help them against Allah Ta'ala. And an example of that is Fir'aun who had everything of dunya but because his sins were so great that it did not help him. His everything did not help him. Now, Ayah 13. At the Kana, does everyone have a translation or something to look at or to share? Okay. At Kana lakum ayatum fi atayni al taqata. Fi atayni al taqata. So, there has already been a sign for you in the two armies that met. Fi'atun tuqatilu fi sabilillah wa ukhra kafiratun yirawnahum mithlayhim ra'al ayn. So one was fighting in the cause of Allah and the other was fighting in the cause of kafirs. Okay. So this is the battle of Badr. Okay. Now if you think about it, when we went through Al-Baqarah, there were not too many ayahs that referred to specific events. All the ayahs were revealed according to specific events, but the ayahs themselves did not mention anything. Here, a specific event is being mentioned, and this is the Battle of Badr. So the Battle of Badr is something that we always teach, and some of the big lessons that we always teach about the Battle of Badr, and all of us, we've heard this so many times, the Muslims only had about 300 some people who were ill-prepared, you know, were not ill-prepared, ill-equipped, and then the Kafirs from the Quraysh, they were coming with as many as a thousand or more people who were all well equipped. <coughs> and the question for the Muslims was, do we face them or not? Why? Because the Muslims were, were the Prophet, peace be upon him, had ordered his companions uh, uh, to take any of the caravans of the Quraysh. Shortly after arriving in Medina, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did a number of things. He, he built the masjid, he changed the name of the city, he made the pact. With, with the Jews of Medina. And he also announced to the Quraysh that, okay, any of your caravans that come within our region, we're going to confiscate. Okay. And so a big caravan belonging to Abu Sufyan was on its way back. And Abu Sufyan did not want to lose his caravans, so, caravan, so he was telling it to take the long way so that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would not, would not seize it. But the other people in the Quraysh were saying, no, send it straight through, through Medina. And we're going to go with an army to, to, to defend it. So, so the Prophet, peace be upon him, his scouts told him okay, that the caravan is coming, and then also that here comes this big force of people coming from, from Makkah. Okay, so he understood this means that they're coming to fight. So he raised the question to his, his companions, should we go fight or not? Which actually is saying, should we go for the, the caravan or not? If we go for the caravan, then the Quraysh is going to come to fight us. If we let it go, then the Quraysh can say, look, Muhammad has no power. So his companions said, okay, we've known you our whole lives. We'll do whatever you do. We will do whatever you tell us to do. Even if you tell us to go jump in water, we'll go jump in water. And remember, these people in the desert, they don't, like, they don't like water. And we're not afraid of these people. These people have been taking things away from us, and we're ready to go fight them. 
And so they decide to go for the caravan, which means they decide to go uh, for, for the fight. Then, as we know, the way we commonly teach the story of, of the Battle of Badr is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is telling his companions, okay, set up a camp here. And some of the companions ask him, is this hukum or is this nasiha? Is this your rule? Is this coming from wahi? Or is this just your advice? He said, no, this is just my advice. And then they said, well, we suggest that you put it over there. Okay. So one thing to think about is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, he always spoke truth. Sometimes he spoke from wahi, sometimes he's giving advice, right? So matters, an issue that always came up was matters like irrigation and farming. He would tell his companions, okay, you know more about this than I do. If I give you advice, then it may not be beneficial. Okay. So, so they set up the camp, and also what do they do? The Quraysh is coming from, in our language, 200, 250 some miles away, 260 miles away. So they take all the wells and they fill up all the wells. The Muslims drink whatever water they need, and they fill up the wells. Why? Because the Quraysh is going to be very, very uh, thirsty. Okay. So this is also a tactic being used in terms of, of the conflict. And then when it's time to fight, this is the old style of fighting, not this modern style of fighting. The modern style of fighting is, okay, you declare war and then you send all your planes and do everything, right? The old style of fighting is one side is on one side and the other, the other force is on the other side. And then you send, at first, one, two, three of your best fighters, right? Now here's where we were talking about, that now the Quraysh has arrived and the Muslims have arrived. The Muslims are on one side, and the Quraysh are, the Quraysh are, are on the other. Where is the Prophet, peace be upon him, at this time, at the, at the beginning of this battle? He's in a, he's in a, a tent right behind them. Yeah. That uh, in Uhud, he's part of the fight. In Badr, he's essentially, he's separate. Yeah. And so, <laughs> when the Quraysh looks at the Muslims, the Quraysh don't see 300 people. They see 2,000 people. Okay. So what do the Quraysh see? They see angels, essentially. Or whatever it is Allah Ta'ala is making them see, but we, we would think that he's making them see angels. Another report is saying when the Muslims, who are 300 people, are looking at the Quraysh, they don't see 1,000 people, they see 2,000 people. Okay. Now, who are those people uh, that the Muslims are seeing? Allah knows best. But what's the lesson there? For the Quraysh, the lesson is, okay, you're not just fighting, you're fighting people who are fighting in the way of Allah, which means you're also fighting angels. Okay. Allah is also sending angels down. The lesson for the Muslims, however, is that you're only 300 people. Even if you saw 1,000 or you see 2,000, what is the point here? That if you're here for any reason other than service to Allah Ta'ala, you're going to get wiped out. Right? Because they outnumber you, they out-weapon they, uh, out, uh, out you, they surpass you in everything. And so if you're there for service to Allah Ta'ala, <coughs> then you leave it to Allah Ta'ala to do whatever. Okay. So the language is that you're not the one who threw, Allah is the one who threw. You're the one who just shows up. So in Ayah 13, this was a sign for you when the two armies met. One was fighting in the cause of Allah, and the other was fighting in the cause of the kafirs. Okay. And they saw them to be twice their own numbers by their own eyesight. Okay. This is what we just said. But Allah supports with his victory whomever he wills. Indeed, that is a lesson for those who have absah, those who have sight. So a big lesson here that we're all setting up is that in Al-Baqarah, the focus was on obedience to Allah Ta'ala. That's the repeated point. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Ali Imran, the focus is making your niyyah, your niyyah, your intention, which is in your heart, to be service to Allah Ta'ala. So obedience to Allah Ta'ala means that when it's time to pray, I pray. Yeah. Maybe, a'udhu billah, I don't even pay attention during my prayer. You know, except for the blink of an eye. Inshallah, that's complete. Right? Just like if I'm fasting. Maybe I don't let myself uh, drink or eat anything. So I fulfill all the minimal rules, but maybe I don't do anything related to deen. Inshallah, at least I'll still get credit for completion. Yeah. Ali Ibrahim is focused on your niyyah, which is coming from your heart. Ali Ibrahim is focused on your intentions, which is coming from your heart. So the obedience part here is that they had to show up to battle. Okay. But the part of the heart is that they're here in service to Allah Ta'ala. I mean, another reason you can show up for battle is because you want to get rich, right? If you win, then they're going to leave the, what we call the spoils of war, and then you just want to collect that. 
and so they're here only out of service to Allah Ta'ala. So if your heart is in service to Allah Ta'ala, then He will, inshallah, give you support from where you can't imagine and you can't see. So keep your finger there and let's go look at Surah Al-Anfal, <coughs> Surah number 8. So Surah Al-Anfal and Surah Al-Baqarah, oh, I'm sorry, Surah Al-Tawbah. Surah Al-Tawbah we know is a very, very tough, tough Surah. Surah Al-Tawbah is speaking about the uh, end of the work in Medina, and Surah Al-Anfal is speaking about the beginning of the work of Medina. And let me find the math formula. So Surah Al-Anfal is speaking essentially about the beginning of the work in Medina, and Surah Al-Tawbah is the end of the work in Medina. Essentially, Surah Al-Anfal is speaking before battle, and Surah Al-Tawbah is after, after battle. Okay, uh, let me just find this. Starting from the Battle of Bad, but Surah Al-Tawbah is after the conference of Makkah. So when the confrontations happen, and follows before all the confrontations, and al baqarah is after, or al tawbah is after. Okay, let me just find this ayah. Uh, Here it is, I, uh, 65. 65. Surah 8, I, 65. And we're going to be revisiting some of these points later on, inshallah. Sixty-five, Surah Eight, Ayah Sixty-five. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, harid al ala al-qital. Sixty-five. Okay, so Allah Ta'ala is telling the Prophet, peace be upon him, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, harid al uh, ala, uh, ala kitab. So urge the mu'mins to fight. Okay. And then he gives, Allah Ta'ala gives a formula here. Okay. If there are 20 of you who have, uh, who have sabr, if there are 20 of you, okay, you can conquer 200. So what's the ratio? 1 to 10. If there are 100, you can conquer a thousand. So essentially, if you have people of Iman, if you have people of Sabr, then your physical might is equal to ten times your size. This is the formula that he's given them. But let's say you are people who do not have very strong Iman, then it goes to Ayah 66. If there's weakness among you, so if there's 100 who have Sabr among you, then you will overcome 200. And if there is a thousand, they'll overcome two thousand. So what's the point here? That we saw in the previous surah when we were looking at Al Baqarah, when the forces of, of Talut met the forces of Jalut, when the forces of Saul met the forces of Goliath, they all started saying, Okay, we have no chance, all these people are giants and they're gonna they're unstoppable. And then people like Dawood alayhi salam were in the crowd and they said, How many times in history has a small army defeated a big army? But what is the key here? The key here is that you have to have Iman. If you have Iman, then your physical might, your physical influence is equal to 10 times your size. If your, army, if your group does not have much Iman, but at least 100 of them does, then it's twice the size. Okay. So let's go back to Ali Ibrahim, Surah 3. So obviously my point here is not about fighting. Right? My point here is about the consequence of Iman, that Allah Ta'ala will help you 
with angels. Yeah, okay, sir. Is there any general Pikmin in that, or is this specific to this, this battle or, or, that, or that time? So, some people use that ayah from Surah Al Anfal to argue that in today's era, you can't, if you're going, if you're fighting Fisa Bilalah, you can't win. Because now, back then, it was people fighting with spears and bows and arrows against people who have spears and bows and arrows, right? Now, you have people who have very many school tools against massive, massive armies. So, and then on top of that, the, uh, the armies have massive weapons, right? And so the point is that, you know, how many, how many pious believers could you possibly have to fight even 10 to 1 to make it even, right? And so, so what you find, find many scholars today say is that the way for today is nonviolence. That if you take the confrontation route, you gotta get you gotta get wiped out. But the ayahs are specific to fighting moment. So the ayahs are specific to fighting moment. Yeah, moments who are fighting. Yeah, is that your question? Yeah. What about in Tawbah? So Surah Tawbah is basically speaking uh, about the instructions after all the battles are complete. Which means this particular ayah. And, and that, just the whole surah in general. Yeah. I mean, there are even different parts of that surah too. Yeah, are you saying that uh, it's just like combat that they are talking about, you, but then you're limiting if you generalize it to say just standing up to somebody or you, yeah, can, this, you know the, you can take it in different ways. I mean that I would use specifically for combat. This right. one you're saying? Yeah, these passages. That no, no, I'm saying the Surah Al Anfal. That I'm saying I'm limiting to combat. Right? Combat specifically? Yeah, mm -hmm. and to look at it from this way. Uh, uh, in terms of, let's say, arguing and debate, mm -hmm. you might have one person who could beat a thousand. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of physical might, that's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, so I'm saying the math actually probably works more in your favor if it's a battle of the intellect. Yeah. See what I'm saying? <coughs> but here lies, uh, I've seen prophet. So he's telling, isn't he telling, is for that specific moment? Well, I... That time? Uh, who is he told to talk to? God is mighty and wise prophet. Okay. Especially telling to the prophet. So isn't he, for that particular moment, he's telling. But who, uh, Allah Ta'ala is telling the prophet to talk to whom? The believer, and the believers. Yeah. Enough for you and the believers. Mm -hmm. So but He's not talking to the believers. He's saying, you. I'm just saying that this may be very specific for sure. the time of the prophet. Sure. Uh, and not Al-Qaeda thing. Well, I mean, the Al-Qaeda thing is a, is a, is a bigger issue. Al-Qaeda <laughs> proves, I think Al-Qaeda proves this formula, right? Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, okay. That they have so many people, and then, you know, how many yeah. nations got obliterated in response. Yeah, yeah. okay. That, uh, uh, that if, uh, a, lot of, a lot of Muslims, especially young Muslims, have the notion that if we go up and fight, Allah Ta'ala is going to help us, and we're going to beat everybody. Oh, right. And here's the formula that, uh, okay, you're not going to be able to, right? Even, aside from the problems with the argument, yeah. the formula doesn't work in your favor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How is this not working in Al-Qaeda's favor? Because, uh, so Al-Qaeda has, let's say Al-Qaeda has 4,000 people, yeah. right? So let's say all of them had strong Iman, mm -hmm. okay? So the, in theory, they could fight out 40,000 people, mm -hmm. okay? But what's been the result? Uh, Afghanistan has been further decimated. Iraq has been further decimated. They've been used as an excuse all over. We can argue okay, the battle's not over, right? But uh, I mean, Allah knows best. I mean, there could be a whole story that none of us know about. But it seems at least that uh, the formula is showing that uh, that Allah Ta'ala is not giving a promise beyond, I mean, beyond what's written here. There's another teaching of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that 12,000 people of Iman cannot be defeated. Okay, it's not easy to come up with too many people of Iman. What to think of 12,000, mashallah, right? Is that a hadith, brother? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you find that in the rhetoric of a lot of, a lot of Muslim groups, that okay, we have to have 12,000 people, but again, 12,000 people of Iman. And it's a prophet, that's his teaching, so if we can produce 12,000 people of Iman, then it's saying that no, nobody can defeat them. Yeah, it's, that's the uh, question, how many people uh, uh, are Allah's best? Yeah. Yeah. But bringing it back to Ali Imran, the key point that, that we're focusing on here in Al-Baqarah was obedience, and Ali Imran is Iman. Yeah. 
So obedience is your physical actions of obedience, staying within boundaries that Allah Ta'ala says to stay in and doing the things he says to do. But my heart might not be in it, right? Just like I might be praying and I'm not paying attention. Right? I might be fasting, and again, I'm not paying attention to the fact of fasting. I'm just fulfilling the obligation. And Surah al Ibran is focusing on Iman. Okay, which brings us now to one of the challenges. Question? No. Uh, I mean, it, it just, it's interesting that, um, because it seems like we focus on Iman first, Whereas if we if we look at the book, I mean, we look at the Quran as, as an order, like we should follow it in order. We really have to focus on obedience first, get the mechanism in place, and then then we then will follow. Yeah, I think I think uh, for some people, they can start with iman and then they focus on obedience, right? If my iman is not making me obey, then it's not iman that I have, right? And so, what this is a really really important point in the sense that okay, suppose I have no sincerity. I have no motivation. Should I pray? Yes. And if I keep praying, uh, it should become like a perpetual motion machine where it should start implanting Iman in me. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if I'm only doing my acts of worship out of obedience, then by definition, that's a level of Iman. Mm -hmm. Right? And then the goal is that if I increase those, that will increase me in doing more Salah. Right? If I only do the Fard, it's hard for me to keep doing Fard. It's hard to sustain. If I do far, then force myself to do sunnah also, it becomes hard for me not to do far. So it becomes easy to do far. Mm -hmm. If I do far and sunnah and nafal, then my default becomes far and sunnah. See what I'm saying? Because shaitan is going to try to wear me down. So the more uh, forces I give against shaitan, not just far, but also sunnah and nafal, shaitan is going to try to you know wear down my nafal and then my sunnah and everything. And so it should make me pray more and more and more, which should implant it. Okay, so, so now what we're talking about are challenges to Iman. So one right here is we're talking about this issue of war and conflict. But now I have 14. I'm guessing this will probably raise a few comments. Zuyina Linnas, this is I have 14 on Surah al Zuyina Zuyina Linnas, Hubbu Shahawat. So, made beautified for the people is love of the things they desire. And what's the list? Minan Nisa, women. Walbanina, and children. Walqanatir. Al Muk Muqanatarati. Minan Dahab. So, this is actually piles and piles of gold and silver. Or will fit the gold and gold and silver. Wal khail al musawama wal anam wal harf. And these fine horses and cattle to till the land. Okay. So beautified is what? What is it that Allah Ta'ala makes beautiful for me? Those things that I desire. Okay. And what are the big things that people of the world desire? Okay. Women? Having children? Wealth, having your your horse, or in today's language, what would this be? Horse. Having a nice car. Okay. What about cattle? What would be today's equivalent of cattle? One guy actually came up to me. Um, he was from he was from a different country, and he was asking me to help him find find a wife. And he lives on a farm, and he says, "Okay, just you know, I uh, I have wealth." And he asked me, "Do you have a sister?" I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Here." I'll give you a cow. Let me marry your sister. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. no, no, thank you. <laughs> so cattle essentially would equal like your, your employment, your, your 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 power, all those things. So. House. Yeah, uh, house. Not just the house, but think of all the auto, all the automation in your house: dishwasher, the air conditioner, the heating, all those things. Right. iPad. Sorry. iPad. IPad, <laughs> iPad, <laughs> iPhone, laptop. Yeah. So w I'm curious whether horses were used because the Arabs had a love of horses, or whether the scholars think that that's an innate love within a human being. I mean, the other day, this has been circulating around the internet, this most beautiful horse in the world, which I guess it was incorrectly attributed to Turkey, but it's actually an Russian. 
I, I saw the picture and I'm just stunned. It is yeah. an absolutely gorgeous horse. Yeah. And, and I don't know if that's, I, I have no love of horses. I don't, I mean, they're nice yeah. animals, but prior to seeing that picture, I, was, I never really thought of it. So I'm wondering whether it's an innate I think there is. love for people and horses. I think that there's something in our design where we have a uh, love for horses. Uh, likewise, uh, I never had an appreciation for horses, but I always loved movies like The Black Stallion. Right. Right. Especially when you watch horses run. There, there's something that seems to be in their design that's appealing to us in, in our design. Yeah. yeah. Uh, about the shape, the speed, all those things. Sorry? So, 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 would you put men on this list too of the things that are desired of the world? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. Explain this. What is, what is, women is not a thing. No, no, but, uh, but no one's saying they're a thing, but, uh, but what is love? Children are not a thing either, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I was thinking of the intermodal transportation that type of camel. So, because that's So, essentially, uh, uh, if you think of just the differences between a camel and a horse, right? Uh, that there was a great love of camels, especially red camels, certain types of camels were more valuable than others. Uh, but in terms of sport, it's horses, right? So think of the appeal of a sports car versus, you know, a sedan. I mean, that's why I was asking about the local people, because obviously they knew the lineage of their own horses. So it was very large for the Arabs at that time, and I was wondering what it was specific to them. Or just generally well, I'm saying it's definitely specific to them because here it's speaking about about women, right? But I think specifically of horses, there's something about them. That, uh, even like you know, uh, uh, if you even think of uh, just uh, like the beauty of a bird when the wings are are, are stretched out, right? I think there's something that we naturally find appealing. Right? Yeah, there's something that's just naturally beautiful about them. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless. Uh, first and foremost, this is speaking to the people of Makkah and Medina, yeah. right? Because uh, uh, even think about that time. Uh, in Makkah, they're writing poetry primarily about what? About love for women. And at the same time, there aren't too many women there because they've done the horrible things to the babies, right? And so here, Allah Ta'ala is also speaking to that. But what is he saying at the end of the ayah? That is the enjoyment of the worldly life. <laughs> but with Allah is the best thing, right? So I might be attracted to all of these things in the list, but the best thing is to seek Allah Ta'ala, right? So he is also speaking to them, you know, all these writers of the great poetry who are writing about women, who are writing also about horses, right? Yeah. All these things are the beauties of this world, okay, but you should seek is Allah Ta'ala. Yeah. But then, uh, but then also, Guru Maksuratun yeah. Again, but again, uh, the first mention that we saw in Al Baqarah was that it's for everybody, men and women, okay. right? Uh, but then later on, it's clearly speaking more for 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 men because that was the audience at the time. Okay, so so now what we're looking at are challenges to Iman. Um, One second, sorry. Please go back. Yeah. So the ayahs have been made attractive. Yeah. So. Um, it's not that these things are innately attractive. I think that's good. Yeah. Keep on. It's, so it's something that's been set up as. Um, it's, so Allah SWT has made these things attractive, or for us as, as like a test. Okay. Or to, I'm asking. Well, the test is everything, right? But uh, yeah. Okay. So look at it this way. Uh, pretty much everything Allah Taala has created has been made attractive. So trees have been made attractive. But you're not going to find too many people for whom tree is an object of their desire. Right? So Allah Ta'ala has made trees attractive. And I give the example of birds. Uh, uh, birds, eagles, hawks are also very attractive. Right? Okay, so I, I, the full ayat, these, these desired things have been made attractive. So these are things that have made attractive and the desires have put into you for them. Yeah. There's, a, there's a name. Human experience, right? And here it's fair to say it's primarily speaking for men, if we're only talking about the first point, but I think everything else might apply to everyone. Yeah. That if we've made this list, different things can attract different people. Right? So I think it's interesting that men are not listed in, in, 
among the desired things. So. <laughs> Uh, Iman, does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's take a short break here so we can pray. Well, I'll that one. I don't know.